समन्वय अद्वित्य रिजा श्रुति एंड रंगोली आई वेलकम यू ऑल आई एम वेरी डिलाइटेड टू वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर दिस इम्पोर्टेंट एंड एक्सट्रीमली रेलिवेंट टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन इन द आई सी एस वेबिनार टूडे माई स्पेशल थैंक्स टू आर वेरी डिस्टिंग्विश पैनल ऑफ स्पीकर्स besides being distinguished which is also a rare panel and i'll i'll, I'll tell you why uh, so uh, i uh, i'm very grateful to all four speakers also because uh, they all very promptly and very uh, uh, quickly accepted and agreed to participate today uh, despite uh, at a very short notice so my special thanks to them Uh, i also acknowledge professor shrimati chakravarti for suggesting and arranging uh, or making it possible for professor lance gore uh, to participate in today's event um, and now uh, let me very briefly uh, share with you my thoughts on why i think that the uh, very panel of speakers is a very rare opportunity for us uh, primarily for two reasons one because uh, all four the all the four speakers come from different geographical locations uh, some very from not so far from china and china's neighborhood and one uh, from uh, rather far away from china and that brings uh, a very um, different of course but also unique perspective together so that is uh, that gives us a lot of uh, interesting uh, opportunity to reflect upon listening to these four different perspectives and a second and perhaps more important reason why i think this is a rare opportunity uh, to be able to hear the views of these four uh, very distinguished speakers is that um, if we put the number of years uh, of their experience together as uh, practitioners of foreign policy and china policy on one hand and uh, also for uh, their engaging um, for a long period of time in the study of both cpc and china and cumulatively put together i think the number of years uh, actually is more than 100 uh, uh, if i can say so so it's a very interesting uh, uh, situation where we are uh, we have the opportunity to listen to such experienced uh, china scholars china watchers china policy practitioners to discuss with us the 100 years of cpc and how the cpc has transformed china lastly uh, of course uh, you must have heard uh, and speaking to the audience and participants a uh, lot of similar uh, titles and topics of various activities celebrating or marking the uh, centenary of the cpc let me just flag out one uh, point which perhaps uh, makes our perspective different uh, from the other similar activities and that is that when a dozen young chinese uh, marxist intellectuals founded the communist party of china 100 years ago they could not foresee how much the cpc would transform china so it follows that we might be blind to what the cpc would look like in the future so with these words and without further ado and just one ground rule uh, for everybody to follow that uh, because of the limitation of time uh, i will request uh, the participants in the question and answer round to send in your questions in writing in the chat box uh, because to save time we will avoid uh, raise hand option and we will read out questions from the chat box Uh, with these words uh, i request and invite ambassador sham saran to kick start today's discussion thank you very much uh, heman 
Uh, I would like to, of course, uh, thank you and thank uh, the Institute for Chinese Studies for uh, not only uh, convening this very interesting seminar, but also giving me an opportunity to uh, share my views about uh, the CPC uh, 100th anniversary. <clears throat> in China, you know, anniversaries are always very important. Uh, you know, they uh, are markers in a sense uh, in terms of the uh, political evolution of uh, the country and particularly the uh, party. Uh, and uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary is, uh, I think, particularly significant uh, and uh, a marker which uh, perhaps uh, has deep meaning uh, for the party. Uh, number one, because uh, unlike other communist parties, it has survived for 100 years. Uh, and that itself is a very important uh, you know, landmark in a, in a sense. So celebration of uh, the 100th anniversary uh, is uh, something really uh, very uh, important, and I think it is uh, it is uh, understandable that so much is being made of this uh, anniversary. Uh, but one should also look at this as uh, a kind of a uh, you know uh, a halfway point to an even more important anniversary, which is coming in 2049, uh, when there will be uh, the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic uh, itself. So in a sense, what uh, uh, is, is being done is that, uh, you know, the stage is being set uh, for even greater achievements, greater successes uh, going forward to the other 100th uh, anniversary. So that is something that we should uh, perhaps be looking out for. What is in store um, from, from now onwards uh, to uh, 2049? Because that's uh, something which... Uh, will be a, a matter of great focus, I think, uh, in terms of whatever we see emerging out of uh, China. Now, uh, to me, the most important, uh, you know, aspect of this celebration is uh, the tremendous amount of, uh, you know, uh, the emphasis which is being given uh, on the leadership of the party, on the one hand, and of course, as part of that leadership, the importance of the core of that leadership, uh, which is the general secretary uh, himself. But uh, I think uh, if you go back to uh, 2017, the 19th party Congress, uh, in a sense, uh, they already set the stage by saying that, uh, you know, the party leads everything, North, South, East, West, Center, whether it's the academics or whether it's economics, everything the party leads. Uh, so that's uh, a very important uh, aspect that we should uh, look at, that what we are seeing is putting the party at the center of the uh, national life, in a sense, uh, of, of China. Uh, secondly, the uh, fact that uh, the core of the leadership or the role of the uh, you know, the, the central leader uh, in, himself. Uh, this is being uh, emphasized. And this is particularly important because we are soon going to have the 20th Party Congress. Uh, and at that Party Congress, perhaps there will be a kind of a formalization of the leadership for life, in a sense, for the General Secretary Xi Jinping himself. Uh, so uh, that also is a certain backdrop to what we have been seeing in terms of the anniversary uh, celebrations. Uh, in fact, uh, Xi Jinping in his uh, 100th anniversary speech itself said uh, that, uh, you know, we should be emphasizing the central importance of the leadership of the party in every possible sphere, but also himself saying that the core of the party leadership, that is the role of the general secretary himself, that is himself, uh, is uh, is the most uh, critical uh, element. So this, to me, is, seems to link up very, uh, very, very directly with uh, what we should expect at the 20th uh, Party uh, Congress. Now, I have argued that, uh, you know, in terms of this uh, shift towards a much more direct and central road of the party, uh, which we have seen over the last uh, few years, uh, is directly related also to how 
uh, how uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party, in particular its leadership today, and Xi Jinping himself, have drawn lessons from the collapse of the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think a tremendous amount of uh, study has been done within the party as to why the very first revolutionary party, uh, the, the Soviet, uh, Soviet Communist Party, why did it suddenly collapse and, and uh, you know, fragment? What were the reasons for that? And why it is necessary for China to study that experience and make certain that that does not happen in China uh, itself. That is something which... Uh, is extremely uh, in, important. Now, here, uh, the, the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we have seen after the end of the great proletarian cultural revolution uh, in uh, 1976, that we saw some major and significant shifts in terms of the role of the party. So under Tan Xiaoping, we had a uh, new era, a new emphasis on collective leadership instead of one individual leader. We had also the party taking on more of a supervisory role rather than a direct role, whether it is in terms of administration or whether it is in terms of uh, uh, business and uh, economic uh, activities. The role of the state-owned uh, enterprises diminished somewhat compared to the uh, compared to the past. Uh, you had the role of the private sector, which became much more, much more prominent. Uh, with regard to, say, the uh, People's Liberation Army, the aspect of professionalism, of training, became much more important rather than ideological uh, you know, credentials of uh, people in terms of promotions, in terms of uh, how the uh, PLA itself was organized. So there was, a, in fact, a great deal of emphasis on professionals. And the party, not that the party became less important, but the party was more in terms of a supervisory. What we have seen under Xi Jinping is that this particular process, which began under Tang Xiaoping, this particular process is, has been, in fact, in a sense, reversed. Uh, so it started off with uh, Xi Jinping setting up of these very uh, you know, party uh, committees, which were uh, in fact, uh, chaired uh, by Xi Jinping himself. So he was uh, considered to be the chairman of uh, everything, in a sense, um, whether it was economic reforms, whether it was external affairs, all these were directly led by these small groups, which were chaired by Xi Jinping himself. So while you had the state bureaucracy, but at the actual decision-making authority actually came to these, these party uh, committees. What you also saw was that in the various enterprises, both public as well as private, the role of the party committees became much more important to the extent of the party representatives actually influencing what will, would normally have been just commercial uh, decisions. And again, if you look at, say, the People's Liberation Army, Quite apart from the professionalism, which continues to be important, the ideological aspect has become very important. So patriotic education, education in the principles of the party, all these have become extremely uh, important. And of course, yeah, while we had collective leadership being emphasized in one case, uh, today the focus is very much on the individual uh, leadership of the top uh, you know, parties, uh, the party leader, that is Xi Jinping himself. So there has been a major shift in terms of the role of the party and the role of the party uh, leadership. Why has this happened? And I think in this context, whatever we see happening during the anniversary, I have argued that uh, the aspect which I mentioned of what lessons were drawn from the collapse of the Soviet uh, Communist Party uh, is very uh, relevant. So in some of the, uh, you know, unpublicized speeches that uh, Xi Jinping made after having become uh, general secretary of the party, uh, one he said uh, with regard to the collapse of the Soviet party is one, that number, the, the, uh, the armed forces, instead of being an arm of the Soviet Communist Party, became a professional army, which 
in a sense, became a kind of a detached organization. Not linked together with the party, not looking at the defense of the party as its primary aim, rather looking at the defense of the country as a primary aim. Now, here the, you have seen how that change has taken place, that it is the party which leads the armed forces, and the armed forces are actually a sentinel of the party. So that's a very important change. Why did the Soviet uh, Communist Party collapse? Because that role of the armed forces to safeguard the interests of the party, that in fact became very weak. And when the crunch came, the armed forces were not there to defend the party. Secondly, uh, he has also made the point that one of the reasons why this collapse took place and collapsed so quickly was because of the lack of ideological commitment. That over a period of time, the ideological commitment of the cadres of the Soviet Communist Party, that became weak. Ideological education became much less important. So all the, all the kind of a ideological energy that a communist party should have, that particular energy in the Soviet case was lost. And therefore, it was very important for the Chinese Communist Party to avoid those mistakes that were made by the Soviet Communist Party. And much of the shift that is being is taking place uh, and which is reflected in the, for example, the speech of uh, Xi Jinping uh, at the anniversary reflects those lessons drawn from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, we may agree or disagree uh, with those, uh, those uh, lessons that have been drawn, but that is how it is being projected uh, as far as China is concerned. Uh, the other point I would like to make is that uh, uh, we should also not uh, uh, neglect the geopolitical backdrop uh, to how this anniversary is being uh, celebrated. So the geopolitical backdrop in particular is the uh, continuing confrontation between uh, China and the United States of America. It is not merely a power confrontation, but it is also becoming more and more an ideological confrontation. That China is in a sense projecting that its model in a sense of governance, its model of economic development, is actually the most efficient uh, model. And the model represented by the United States, the capitalist model, has something which has become quite bad. So there is no doubt, in a sense, that in the ideological struggle, in the struggle between systems, uh, the Chinese system actually uh, represents the pathway of the future. Uh, and that confidence is reflected, again, in the speech made by uh, Xi Jinping. The, uh, of course, uh, I will finally end with the, this other, con in, a, in a sense of contradiction or a paradox, that even while there is this great uh, you know, confidence about the success of China, uh, which has been, in fact, a very spectacular uh, success, uh, there is also a very deep insecurity of you know, how, how, to, how to keep this uh, going in a, in, in, in a sense. Uh, that is always the uh, you know, uh, paradox of uh, more authoritarian leadership that uh, the more power you acquire, the more uncertain you become, the more uh, you know, sort of uh, anxious you become about your ability to hold on to that power. And you see this uh, very much uh, in the manner in which you know, the leadership, Chinese leadership is presenting uh, itself. It is still looking at threats within the country uh, to the untrammeled power of the, of the uh, central uh, leadership. Uh, this, this keeps uh, coming out every, every now and then. You've seen the more recent sort of cleaning up of the entire public security uh, establishment in China. Uh, you see today, uh, you know, the tremendous pressures which are being brought on the big high-tech companies in China, uh, whether it is uh, Alibaba or, uh, uh, you know, this uh, Tencent, all these very major success stories in China's, uh, you know, uh, private private sector business 
all these are under tremendous amount of pressure because at uh, in at a certain level precisely because they have acquired such a lot of economic strength and economic influence they are seen also as somehow you know uh, undermining the uh, influence and authority of the party uh, leadership uh, so there is a tremendous amount of pressure being uh, put on them uh, also it derives from the uh, contest that i said with the with the united states because if high tech is going to be really the area of contestation in the future then china wants to make sure that with regard to those very new areas of technology such as artificial intelligence machine learning uh, china is in fact right in the front rows so this is uh, very much uh, related to that sense of you know competition uh, so there is this paradox as i said both uh, in terms of the confidence that is displayed but also in terms of the fragility which seems to keep pro uh, cropping up uh in in many other ways uh with regard to the current situation uh in china now as far as um, uh, india is concerned finally uh we have to be very mindful of the changes that are taking place within china because it has also been our experience that much of the policy towards india in particular uh, are also related to what is happening domestically within china uh, itself so it is always very important not only to look at the external aspects of china's policy but also look at what may be the drivers of those policies uh, from the domestic uh, side and i think uh, in 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 those terms the uh, kind of churn which might be taking place uh, in china is something which will definitely have an impact on the uh, way india china relations uh, you know evolve uh, in the uh, in the future in the coming coming days uh, one aspect that i would like to of course uh, point out is that it is also becoming very apparent that uh, uh, china under xi jinping in a sense is reverting back to looking at the world in a very hierarchical fashion now this is something which is fairly ingrained domestically within china hierarchy is very important harmony is in fact related to the maintenance of hierarchy and that is also now being sort of imposed in terms of external uh, you know posture of china uh, that if china wishes to see uh, peace and security in its own neighborhood uh, in the in in the geopolitical sphere it is very important that a hierarchy is maintained and china's role as being the top of that hierarchy is also acknowledged and in that sense you know if india is seen as not accepting its place in that hierarchy and contesting china's uh, you know uh, being the dominant power certainly in asia uh, that will mean that the tensions between the two countries uh, will in fact Uh, continue because it is uh, i think it is ingrained in china's uh, china's thinking that there should be an acknowledgement there should be a respect for what china has been able to achieve and emerge as one a uh, front ranking power particularly in asia so today it is unlike what you know tang xiaoping may have said to rajiv gandhi in uh, 1988 that you know an asian century cannot be possible without the simultaneous in a sense emergence of both india and china that the asian century will be built on these two pillars of india and china uh, today it is very clear that uh, china under xi jinping sees only one pillar as far as the asian order is concerned and that is the chinese pillar it is not that india has a parallel role in terms of you know determining that asian uh, century and that is something that we have to understand very clearly that as long as this power gap between india and china continues to expand it is very difficult to change the strategic calculus which drives uh, china's policy uh, policies uh, today thank you very much for your attention thank you ambassador saran um, as expected you given us a lot to chew on in your short uh, presentation uh, and i will not dare to sum it up and also because of the limitations of time and before i invite uh, our next speaker professor lance gore 
I wish to make two quick announcements. One, uh, all our speakers today and uh, some of our ICS fellows, they have been writing columns and commentaries on the CPC 100 years. And we have provided in the chat box a reference uh, link of all these articles. Uh, please have a look. Uh, and the second announcement is that uh, uh, Professor Mohanty, uh, because of uh, last minute uh, unavoidable developments, uh, is not able to join us. So we will have uh, Dr. Bhim Subha, my co-host for today, uh, filling in for him. And uh, he will speak uh, in place of uh, Professor Mohanty. And now I invite Professor Lance Kaur, who, uh, as you must have read the brief bio, I did not read out the bios because of the time shortage, but Professor Lance Gore has been a prolific writer uh, on China and China's developments, both in Chinese and English. And I'm sure uh, some of the points which we uh, heard from Ambassador Shamsaran, uh, especially the CPC, CPSU, the lessons CPC has drawn or is drawing or is uh, making efforts to draw lessons from the CPSU collapse and the Soviet Union collapse will also be perhaps touched upon uh, by Professor Lansgore. Professor Lansgore, please, your 15 minutes now. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you, uh, exchange views with uh, my Indian uh, colleagues. Uh, the, um, the ambassador uh, talked a wide range of uh, issues. Uh, um, so I wouldn't, uh, I don't want to repeat. Uh, I, I think uh, all of those are very, very uh, um, excellent insightful points. I don't want to repeat what he, he has already covered. I would like to, you know, uh, uh, follow from a more historical line of analyzing the dynamic of, of this Communist Party, uh, why it is, uh, uh, it is now, uh, and what are the problems it is encountering, and uh, what are the, you know, uh, um, the prospect, the policy directions that I think it is likely to uh, to head in towards. Uh, you know, uh, the CCP is a product. I don't think it's a product of Marxism or ideology. I think it's mostly a product of the Chinese. Uh, I would say a revolutionary situation that China, Chinese civilization couldn't go on as it is because it is behind the world, behind the modern Western industrial um, um, uh, civilization. So it has to change. And how do you change such a big country? Uh, the most likely um, consequences. I think uh, th there's a lot of uh, examples uh, literally around the world that is uh, when you have this kind of change, uh, the country fall apart. So here, Communist Party came in, uh, came in to play a role of uh, providing the direction to tie things together, to mobilizing uh, the forces uh, in, uh, uh, inmates in a society in order to uh, accomplish uh, this uh, revolution. Um, and the Lenin, Leninist party provided the ideal example uh, for the earlier communists. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, have followed uh, the recent day China, in China, there's a TV series, a very, very popular, uh, um, talk about uh, the establishment of the Communist Party in the 20s uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the reasons the intellectuals uh, come to conclusion that uh, it has to organize a party, it has to follow the Russian October Revolution's road. I think this is uh, uh, the Chinese historical necessity that uh, I think China is lucky that uh, there is a group of people organized a very effective uh, party organization uh, and provided, uh, 
you know, um, uh, um, in China, there's not much working class. Uh, of course, that's, uh, that's uh, very different from Marxian Max, view. So the, the, the Chinese uh, Mao Zedong's uh, genius is to mobilize the peasants, unleash the grievances among the peasants, uh, to organize their, their forces uh, to launch uh, a successful uh, revolution. I think uh, the Nationalist Party failed because it didn't have this kind of organization, have, didn't have this kind of uh, coherence. Uh, therefore, you know, it, it, fail, it failed, it lost to the Communist Party. Uh, however, here the, the key is that the, the uh, waging revolution, you need a revolutionary ideology. I think Marxism fits in very well, class struggle, you know, um, uh, get rid of exploitation, oppression, and the national independence. All these are struggle uh, oriented uh, sort of uh, um, party policy, and uh, the CCP used that very successfully. Okay. Now it established the PRC in 49, 1949, and uh, the Communist Party itself was continued to be uh, organized on Leninist principles. Uh, and uh, uh, now it faces a very different uh, uh, task, which is building the, the, uh, the nation, industrialization, etc. And uh, that uh, required, honestly, very different set of uh, organization principles, uh, policies, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, different approach. Uh, that in the 50s, in the early 60s, uh, yes, the Communist Party uh, is more moving, more or less uh, following the uh, Soviet Union's example. But Mao, uh, that dissatisfied with Mao. Uh, Mao, himself is a revol master revolutionary. It hates, uh, he hates uh, bureau bureaucratic establishment. Uh, he believed the uh, Soviet Union become a, uh, um, the communist, uh, communist part of Soviet, Soviet Union become a, uh, itself become a ruling class, ruling uh, bourgeoisie, they call the new, new capitalists. Um, serving itself. So uh, uh, to keep that revolutionary uh, revolution alive, uh, Mao keep on starting um, uh, campaigns, uh, after campaigns, uh, after campaigns, uh, to utilize uh, his uh, skill of leading the revolution and also to keep himself at the center of the power because uh, that's his comfort zone to lead a revolution. And uh, uh, it turned out uh, his approach, yes, indeed, uh, uh, consolidated his power. But, but however, you know, Chinese economy suffered as a result. Okay, so when Mao passed away, Deng came in. He said, we cannot push revolution uh, the way Mao did. We have to concentrate on modernization. So you see a significant period when the ideology and the organization of the party becoming loosened up, becoming, uh, you know, um, um, uh, the, the cent central authority uh, begin to disintegrate. You know, it released uh, uh, the amount of population, released uh, the entrepreneur energy, but the party organization suffered and the, 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 the party central authority suffered. Um, so that's where Xi Jinping came in. Xi Jinping said, we cannot keep on like this because uh, you know, without the party discipline, corruption is everywhere. And uh, uh, local um, you know, uh, oligarchies, uh, you know, local, local emperors, uh, uh, they, they push for their own ways. They do not listen to the center. He said, we have to, you know, uh, change direction. We have to uh, build, rebuild the party. So party building uh, actually took the bulk of his energy during his first 
first uh, term. Uh, so uh, it's all about that building party, uh, cent centralized uh, power, uh, um, uh, emphasizing uh, discipline, building party organizations, uh, and put party uh, uh, re reorganize the party uh, and uh, re-emphasize uh, ideology because uh, this party depend on ideology to keep its co internal co cohesion. Okay. Uh, so in a way, Xi Jinping brought the Maoist back. You know, some of the Maoist thrust he brought back uh, in order to uh, to save the party, so to speak. Uh, however, it has uh, also brought back some problems from Mao's area. Uh, that is, uh, how do you deal with uh, the how do you deal with the the relationship between revolution? and uh, economic modernization, okay? These two do not go together very well, okay? So now you see Xi Jinping suffer from uh, the idea, how do you, you know, you want to uh, uh, fighting Leninist discipline, the party, you need a revolutionary ideology. However, now we need a, uh, uh, peaceful society, we need a harmonious society. How do you, you know, uh, deal with this revolutionary aspect of the, uh, of the ideology? So he began to introduce uh, Confucianism, Chinese tradition, trying to tow down the, the ever revolutionary edge, okay, uh, to, um, to stabilize the society. He doesn't want a, another cultural revolution. Okay, so um, that one, I think he's still struggling. He hasn't been successful uh, on that uh, theoretically. He uh, introduced a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, daily behavior, family, uh, you know, ethics, et cetera. Uh, uh, that part is easy to introduce, but how do you, uh, uh, how do you integrate uh, this, Marxism ideology with Chinese tradition. It's an unresolved problem. Okay, then the fin final thing I think I want to talk about the, is this idea of uh, socialism. Okay, the Communist Party started uh, uh, with the goal, actually its appeal is to have a, a equal society. Everybody benefit from uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, fruit uh, from uh, economic construction. Um, but uh, during the last 30, uh, you know, before Xi Jinping's 30 years, uh, the income gap uh, widened. I think it's uh, reaching to the level of, uh, the, 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 you know, Latin America uh, level. So there's a lot of dissatisfaction. That's why Maoism was very popular among certain groups of people. So um, now you want to, you want to um, uh, satisfy a whole range of people, the rich people as well as the poor people. So what do you do? Now you will emphasize socialism, so-called uh, common prosperity, you know, get to get, get rich, together. So that's his policy emphasis now. That's why you see uh, he deal with uh, this uh, Alibaba and other big, uh, uh, you know, corporations, uh, private corporations. Uh, and it doesn't want them to go the way that uh, uh, US uh, big corporation, high tech corporation, the way they go, you know. Uh, he doesn't think uh, that will will serve China's uh, uh, Communist Party's objective. Uh, it undermine the Communist Party, undermine the Chinese uh, Chineseness of uh, the Chinese socialism. So he take on those uh, uh, things, and uh, from next five to ten years, you will see more and more programs uh, introduced, policies introduced to emphasize uh, equality emphasize socialism so as to you know put the party's legitimacy on a on a more solid basis you know i will stop there thank you 
Thank you, uh, Professor Gore. Uh, uh, let me now uh, move on to our third speaker. But again, before I invite Dr. Bhim Subha, who will be filling in for Professor Mohanty, I have to make a quick announcement that uh, uh, our fourth speaker, Professor Rana Mitra, uh, will not be joining us in person as actually uh, he is on vacation uh, today. So instead, he has sent us a recorded statement of his views, which we will play um, after Dr. Bhim Subha's presentation. Uh, and also we will have, uh, after the presentations, uh, actually Dr. Bhim Subha, along with Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, were requested to be the lead questioner today. And now since uh, there is a slight uh, change in roles and Bhim Subha is one of the speakers, so I will fill in for Bhim Subha as a lead questioner. And we will have uh, Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, uh, who, is, um, who teaches at Ashoka University and specializes in history of international relations. And I would be asking the lead questions after Dr. Rana Mitter's recorded statement is played. Uh, thank you. And now Dr. Bhim Subha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you. Dr. Adla Kha for promoting me today uh, for this role to be a speaker. And uh, my, uh, you know, coming at third after, uh, you know, two excellent presentations by uh, Ambassador Sharon and Professor Lanskor, uh, I have tried to tailor my presentations, uh, what they haven't tried to speak on, but definitely will be fo focusing more on the party itself, the organization and, and what already uh, Professor Lance Gore had talked about is Leninism within the party. And uh, he has also alluded how Leninism and you know, today's China's modernization cannot go hand to hand. But nevertheless, I will be still focusing on Leninism as a uh, form of organization, uh, organizing principle for the CPC that has really led to its sustainability until today, I would say. So that is uh, one of my first argument uh, that I will uh, talk on. And the second one is I will really try to see how uh, so-called Communist Party of China has uh, try to evolve itself historically and more so after the formation of new China that is the establishment of the PRC in 1914 and onwards until today. And thirdly, I would also try to, uh, try to briefly highlight on how uh, China's uh, you know, Communist Party, so to say, uh, the Communist Party of China has interacted with other parties uh, in the neighborhood and as well as um, uh, different parts of the world. And I think at these three aspects that I'm gonna discuss that I'll take the first one. So yeah, definitely. Uh, when we talk about the CPC as an institution today and uh, more so today uh, discussion of institutionalization of politics within China under the Communist Party led by Xi Jinping, it has uh, come under much uh, censure and debates today. Why is it? Uh, I think the literature today shows, and as well as our readings of both the Chinese and other English sources that has come out from China and as well as different parts of the globe, say that, that how institutionalization with, uh, under Xi Jinping has not led to, uh, you know, led to political, so to say, institutionalization. It is talking of institutionalization, but of the party itself. But when you talk about the party, party's institutionalization is different from political institutionalization because the formation of norms and principles that have come uh, and been established in, in, the, in the party has not taken shape in the political sphere of the state institution. So that is one of the aspects that uh, I, I want to uh, you know, flesh it out. And secondly, with the principles of Leninist, Leninism per se, Leninism as Professor Lance Gore has already mentioned that it is in contradiction with 
the challenges that Xi Jinping is facing today. Uh, nevertheless, he has unleashed party re rectification campaigns uh, via anti-corruption uh, movement campaigns and you know other strict measures in all uh, you know structures, institutions of the party, and today at the more at the state level. So this shows that how constant Xi Jinping is under pressure to really prove himself to really sustain or uh, I think he has in fact taken a task uh, to uh, be the keen, I mean, uh, uh, custodian of the party itself. So how, do you, how does Xi Jinping or the Communist Party of China resolve this crisis? I think this will be an uh, important challenge for Xi Jinping in the days to come because Leninism per se and uh, party, uh, you know, via uh, re, uh, you know, institution, institutionalizing succession politics within Leninism per se is quite uh, uh, contradictory in, in, in nature because Leninism have not discussed about succession politics per se there. So how does the, how does the party resolve this is an important aspect that one has to see. And secondly, uh, you know, uh, as I say, like looking at the structure or the organization of the party that has evolved today, uh, we see uh, the party documents and the party uh, literature talks about how, you know, it's the membership has changed. Uh, the structures of the membership have changed. The, the qualifications of memberships have changed and definitely it is. And if you see uh, how uh, different gender representations and today even so to say even the new uh, you know uh, new uh, as, as Professor Lance talk, uh, talk about there was no working class then in the 1920s so uh, Mao, uh, Mao's contribution in fact to Marxism Leninism thought is in fact how peasant was mobilized as an important source of revolution so how is this revolution being shaped within the party and literature and discourse. I think uh, that is one, uh, an aspect that really as a scholar and analyst of uh, China today, we really need to focus on. And, and so to say, when we talk about the representation per se, now uh, the party is 95 million, I mean, uh, you know, organization, but out of 95 million, you could see hardly like more than uh, two, 2,000 to 4,000, uh, you know, 2,000 to really 3,000, uh, you know, elite leaders coming up there, the cadres, the person. So how does these elite cadres try to justify their rule and try to promote themselves? That is an important question today. Uh, in, uh, in, you know, in the 80s, there was a debate that if, if an educated person, as, as an important uh, uh, educated a highly educated, uh, you know, uh, Western Stanford or Harvard educated could, uh, you know, foreign degrees were so important. But today is that foreign degree important? Or is, is, is the party still banking on those uh, return turtles coming to China and occupying important places? And that has really changed a bit. And under Xi Jinping strictly it is. And in 2018, I remember reading one paper by a candidate in Peking University. See, in her research, she traced that after Xi Jinping came to Kappa until 2013, getting, uh, you know, until 2013, get, getting a membership of the Communist Party was relatively easier. But after that, increasingly, it has become very narrow and the chances to get selected is very, very narrow. So how do we now, if a lot of these educated elites are the new, uh, you know, custodians or so to say, future, uh, future members or elites or educated, uh, you know, uh, um, members? How could they be the part of this CPC as a gravy train? Uh, is is the CPC today uh, an iron dress bowl for all this? Can CPC sustain this? So how is CPC mobilize the state? And how could it uh, lead to, uh, you know, uh, addressing some of the concerns or some of the demands of these new educated elites? And more to say, 
more number of educated, I mean, in, in China is increasing. So these are some of the important challenges that CPC is gonna face back. And thirdly, uh, is, and that would be my final uh, an intervention here, is the Communist Party's uh, of China's uh, relation with other so-called democratic parties, uh, not to say democratic parties within the state of the PRC, but so to say more on with relations to other uh, you know, parties, political parties and organizations of different. And in, in June 2000, uh, this year, uh, reading into reports, different reports use, uh, the CPC came out with, uh, you know, interna uh, International Legion Department, Work Department came out with that. It had relations with more than 600 political parties and political organizations across the globe. Now, so to say, how does this show, uh, you know, the, the, the orientation or the organization of the CPC. It shows that CPC has evolved over a time. And, and mostly, you know, when in the good old days, you could see only CPC interacting with so-called fraternal parties, that is communist parties or socialist parties of different countries. Even in India, uh, we could see in the height of Doklam crisis, uh, uh, the Chinese embassy were reaching out to different political parties here. And having seen and participating in some of those uh, meetings, we could see the, the, the evolution at the structure of the, how the structure of the party itself and making its presence felt in lesioning with different political stakeholders in different parts of the country, in different parts of the globe. So this is that the Communist Party per se has evolved, but evolved nevertheless with a lot of uh, you know, troubles also. And some of the troubles that, as I, as I said before, is, is definitely is, is, is what Professor Lyons talk about was, is cultural enough? If, 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 Confuci if Confucianism is an appropriate or is, is it the right, I mean, tool to really uh, focus Communist Party of China as a new uh, ideology, uh, it is, I think it is too early to say. Nevertheless, the party is trying. I hope, and uh, Wang Huning is a busy person today. More so, I think he, he is becoming even busier after giving up his, uh, I think, uh, uh, his, uh, in the party central office there, you know, promoting his junior as a senior. There. And, and, the, and, the, and one of the important question today is also with regard to succession, as I had said to you before, how does this succession deal? And Xi Jinping being in power for the last nine years already, and into 2020, we have 2020 party, you know, party Congress, we have the 20 party Congress to next year or so. So how is the party gonna discuss this? Take this in the party, uh, you know, and how would it lead to, uh, you know, addressing some of the challenges that the elites are trying to say that, as Professor Lance had argued in one of his papers, is when the Soviet Union broke, uh, you know, down, uh, I think imploded uh, the Communist Party of Soviet Union. There was no one person there to really uh, push, uh, save the party. Will Xi Jinping, or is the CPC banking too much on Xi Jinping to be the lone person to save the party? I think uh, 2022 onwards will tell that. I'll stop here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Suba. That was excellent. And uh, I, I think all the three speakers have given us uh, more than what we had expected to chew on. Uh, let me now move on to the last uh, presentation, which is a recorded statement uh, from Dr. Professor Rana Mitta. May I request Colonel Venkat or Shruti to please uh, put the recording on? Hello, this is Rana Mitter speaking from Oxford University. I'm sorry I can't join you today, but I look forward to speaking a few words that I hope give some thoughts about the Chinese Communist Party at the age of 100. And I hope that today's conference goes extremely well.
I don't think that the young men who gathered in Shanghai and founded the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, would have had any idea that the party they were starting up would turn into that kind of machine that was going to rule over a quarter of humanity. Today, of course, the CCP governs a country of 1.3 billion people, cities studded with skyscrapers, astonishing entrepreneurial cultures of technological and economic innovation, but also the ruthless suppression of political dissent. And all of this, I think, can be captured in some ways in a Marxist term that Mao Zedong himself, as a party founder, was always very keen to use, and that is the term contradiction. And there are contradictions aplenty in today's CCP, perhaps more visible now that the party has become less embarrassed than it was even a generation ago about painting itself as an explicitly Marxist force. I think perhaps one of the single most important contradictions is the fact that the Chinese Communist Party is governing one of the most capitalist societies anywhere on earth. Now, at this conference, I think there will be, you know, will not come as a matter of any surprise to uh, anyone that we are talking about a country where, which long ago abandoned the Soviet style command economy. But the market driven economy is one in which today's party state still plays a major role as an enabler of capitalism rather than a destroyer of it. And of course, since the 2000s, uh, a later leader, Jiang Zemin, would officially welcome business leaders into the party through his theory of the three representations. So today, the Chinese Communist Party, and this is a contradiction, I think, is a party that wears business suits, not boiler suits. And yet, it is, of course, a very male party. While there are growing numbers of women leaders at lower levels, the closer you get to the Politburo, the fewer there are. The business elite in China, I think it's fair to say, has become more steadily female in many ways over the years. The political elite in the party, still far fewer, at the top level. And those again, I think, point up some of the difficulties and contradictions that the party has had in defining itself over the centuries, uh, over the century. Yet some other things don't change. One characteristic that has not changed since the 1920s has been the party's obsession with control and with power. It spent much of its, much of its first few decades on the run from its enemies, notably the nationalist Kuomintang party of Chiang Kai-shek, and of course, the other great enemy, the Japanese during World War II. The Long March of 1934 to five has become a legendary tale of heroism in the eyes of the party, still very much a touchstone. But of course, at the time, it was nothing like that. It was a forced retreat in the face of near certain defeat. And the zero sum nature of the party has continued ever since 1949, when Mao brought the party to power. There's never been any real prospect of a pluralist democracy in China, while it still remains a Leninist party. Although there have been times of relative openness, such as the 1980s and the early 2000s. But the desire of the party to stay in command has always been its driving characteristic, and I think there's little chance of that changing. 1989, the Tiananmen Square killings were, of course, an indication that the CCP would not easily give up its use of force to protect its interests but there have been many cases since then in the more than 30 years since those tragic events. One way, of course, to try and gain more access to understanding where the party will go next is to see where it has come from. And it has a fascinating history, but you'll read relatively little about it in China itself, where the past 100 years have given way to a sort of hagiographical interpretation, uh, mostly about the inevitability of the CCP's rise to power. Um, in fact, you might almost say the real achievement of the party was the opposite, that it managed to go as far as it has done when it was so often so perilous and so, under, uh, so perilously placed and so much under threat. Repeated infighting, the murder of communist cadres by one another, has been a feature of much of the party's history. And the violence associated with intra-party purges, such as the rectification movement of the 1940s, has been sanitised in official histories. But they remain key moments in understanding why violence and obedience remain so central to the party. There's much discussion in today's China of the rise to power of the party and its political and economic astuteness. But it's much harder even today to discuss events such as the terrible Great Leap Forward famine of 1958 to 62, the product of a failed economic experiment that killed 
20 billion or more people through starvation. We're also in an era today when the Chinese Communist Party thinks long and hard about its relationship with the wider world, uh, its relationship with the United States being, bar none, the most important and fractious relationship. The US, of course, is seen by the party not just as an economic and strategic competitor, but also as an ideological challenge. The CCP is always keen to portray itself as a peaceful advocate of non-interference, and it wants to create the opposition of a wild-eyed America, which Beijing portrays largely in terms of events such as the Iraq War and the excesses of the Donald Trump years. Other countries are more and more being assessed in terms of their closeness or distance to America, and India's recent moves towards the Quad, uh, working more with the US, Japan, Australia on defence and security issues, has raised hackles in Beijing. I'm sure that that is a source of friction that has not yet um, played, uh, played itself fully through. Leadership matters for the party as well. It always has and it always will. The turn towards the very authoritarian incarnation of the CCP we start to see today did not start with Xi Jinping's rise to power in 2012. Things had actually turned much colder even a few years before. But there's no doubt that Xi Jinping is a master of narrative, with himself at the centre of that narrative. He sees himself as a figure destined to bring China back to the global role that it last had under the Qing emperors of the 18th century, and perhaps briefly under Mao in the mid-20th. His instrument for doing that is the party, which Xi argues should be in control of everything in China. In his, in his words, east, west, south, north and centre, the party leads everything. But although Xi's style and his promotion of his own personality remind many people of Mao, in one important area the two are very different. Mao's ultimate goal was the mobilisation of his own people, an idea which led, in the end, to the disaster of the anarchic cultural revolution of 1966-76. to 76. Xi's party does not share Mao's desire. It wants China to rise, but its people are supposed to have a Confucian relationship with their leaders, not a Maoist one. They should know their place and be pleased to receive the benevolence assigned to them by the power of consumerism, new apartments, mobile phones, vacations, a good education. Xi's party does make bargains, but today's CCP makes technocratic and consumerist bargains, not revolutionary ones. In other words, firmly authoritarian, global in scope, consumerist in aspiration, and innovative in technology. The founders of the Chinese Communist Party, I think, could hardly have imagined what they set in motion a hundred years ago. And I know at the conference, many fine speakers will be exploring many aspects of this particular question. I hope it goes extremely well, and apologies again that I can't be with you today. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Colonel Venkat, can we come back to the normal screen? Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, with first round of the presentations over, um, now we enter into the second part of our uh, discussion. Uh, may I now request Dr. Pallavi Raghavan to um, ask her lead questions. Uh, she can ask two questions to any of the panelists or address to all the panelists. Uh, Pallavi, are you there? Yeah, Pallavi, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello. It's, hello. Yes. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed listening to such, you know, such a diverse and kind of rich 
and succinct set of uh, presentations. You know, I myself am not a historian of China. You know, and and, and please forgive. I mean, I kind of ask, apologize in advance if uh, you know my questions kind of come off as uh, kind of uh, you know from a wider, more generalist kind of view. I myself am a historian of South Asia, of modern South Asia. I work on diplomatic history in India-Pakistan relations. But since I'm here, I you know I thought I'd take this opportunity just to kind of uh, push the speakers forward a little bit uh, and ask them to kind of dwell on the, uh, uh, you know, what do you think are the nature of the similarities between India and China? And despite the seemingly kind of binary uh, contrast between a democratic state and an authoritarian uh, uh, regime, uh, you know, if you kind of, you know, when, when, when I was listening to the speakers, like if you kind of take away the phrase communist party, you know, from the presentations, many of the themes that they were raising were actually quite pretty familiar to South Asian politics. Uh, for example, I mean, you know, uh, particularly, for example, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the kind of emphasis on the cult of personality, I mean, these days, you know, I, I mean, I don't have to give you any examples about, you know, the importance that personality plays in politics, uh, the suspicion of dissent. Uh, the um, uh, you know uh, uh, so political features of South Asia as well as the you know the emphasis on uh, a civilizational heritage which is linked to uh, you know a, a bigger conversation about the nature of decolonization you know and 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 the kind of kind of emphasis that comes about you know Confucianism and 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 and, and, a, and a broader civilizational kind of uh, drive that pushes China uh, which in turn comes out of you know memories of humiliation as Manjiri Miller and many others have kind of worked on, uh, you know, which are about uh, an alternative reading of decolonization. Um, these sets of things, you know, how, you know, they also apply to South Asia as well. And I wanted to ask the panel, you know, to what extent do you think some of these features are, uh, you know, similar to the, you know, to, to, to to, to South Asia. And my second question, you know, just, uh, you know, again, uh, since I'm here, um, and it's, you know, it, it, it was, it's sort of related to what I was asking in the first, um, you know, it's that uh, one of the things I, I came across this line in the archives, which I really enjoyed, uh, K.M. Panikar in 1949 uh, is writing dispatches back to Delhi about the, the ongoing civil war. And he kind of uses to Nehru that look, he thinks that the rise of the Communist Party is to do with how there's no sort of structural organization similar to the ICS in China. And actually what's going on, you know, the reason that the, that the Communist Party kind of wins so rapidly and takes, you know, gains so much ground is that, you know, unlike in India where there's the ICS that kind of, kind of curtails or tempers all attempts at, you know, any attempt to kind of, uh, you know, uh, a revolutionary thinking in China, they don't have the ICS to kind of fall back on, and this is why they're kind of falling into the party so much. Um, so, I, I mean, I wondered if you might like to kind of, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, apart from the ideology, like what are the other structural features that ground the Communist Party in China? Thank you, uh, Pallavi. Um, since you have not specified any particular panelist to uh, address. So I, I believe it is open to all the panel speakers. Uh, um, may I request anyone to pick, pick on any thread uh, from the questions posed by Dr. Pallavi Raghavan? Uh, maybe uh, I can request in the same order in which we had the presentations. Uh, Ambassador Saran, would you like to uh, respond? Yeah, thank you. Um... Well, I think Pallavi has raised some uh, important and rather stimulating, you know, issues. Um, let me let me uh, say that, uh, uh, of course, there is uh, uh, some parallels between the Indian experience and the uh, Chinese experience. Uh, but let me make the point that um, uh, it is not uh, that they are dissimilar in terms of, uh, you know, all states, whether communist or capitalist, you know, all states uh, have a tendency to be predatory in nature. You know, um, states uh, have a natural tendency to accumulate more authority and more power. So in that sense, there is not much difference between, say, India and China or for that matter, you know, some, some other major uh, powers. 
Uh, I think what is perhaps different is that uh, there is a certain imposed accountability and transparency, which uh, theoretically, at least, a, a democratic state uh, has. Uh, while we see in China that that kind of accountability, holding the state accountable, uh, holding the uh, you know uh, government accountable to the citizen, uh, this is very weak. Uh, of course, there has always been the mandate of heaven, and the mandate of heaven is withdrawn, and uh, change takes place. Uh, but uh, the accountability in terms of day-to-day -day functioning of the state, uh, that accountability, that transparency may not be there. So however imperfect uh, the, the democratic system may be, I think one of the important features is that element of accountability, is that element of you know, trans uh, transparency. Now, uh, one can also uh, argue that uh, you know, the kind of checks and balances, which, for example, are, are uh, an important feature of a uh, democratic uh, state. Uh, if you look at what has been happening over the last uh, several years, uh, there is a certain impatience with that kind of deliberative nature of uh, a democratic state, even in democracies. So whether it is related to uh, you know, mounting inequalities in uh, democratic uh, societies because of, uh, you know, the manner in which uh, uh, liberal economic theories have actually led to accumulation and concentration of wealth and incomes. Uh, there is, there is a, a certain, as I said, impatience uh, with uh, democracies. Uh, we see a tendency to uh, sort of, you know, uh, place more faith in uh, a strong, decisive uh, leader who is not uh, in any way restrained by uh, the uh, sort of constitutional, uh, you know, restraints, uh, the uh, the element of uh, accountability. Uh, there is what I could have called in, in, in other circumstances as a dictator envy. Uh, that dictators are far more, far more, uh, you know, efficient in terms of delivery uh, than, uh, you know, uh, democratically elected uh, leaders may be, uh, which, uh, by the way, is not true. Uh, you know, the assumption that, uh, you know, uh, delivery is better under authoritarian, uh, you know, regime uh, is a myth. Uh, it doesn't really uh, happen that way. But there is, there is that, uh, that kind of a perception. So I would say that uh, there is, in the present historical context, there is perhaps a sense that uh, a Chinese kind of system has been more successful than democratic system. And hence, there is a certain market for those kind of ideas of authoritarianism or decisive leadership, uh, even in our uh, country. Uh, but I certainly think and I hope that it is mainly a passing uh, phase. Uh, that's not really something which is, which is going to be uh, an enduring uh, phenomenon. Uh, with regard to some other aspects that you have mentioned, you know, uh, the sense of, um, you know, being, being uh, legacies of a very rich and long-standing civilization. Uh, yes, uh, China and India have a similar kind of uh, self uh, self, uh, you know, image of being being uh, very uh, sorry of uh, being uh, very um, uh, you know important uh, important uh, you know players who have a certain uh, kind of a you know uh, role to play uh, both in Asia as in as well as in the in the in the world. Uh, that uh, self image is certainly very strong in India. It is certainly very strong in uh, in uh, china but the way in china has looked at or uh, or the present dispensation in china has looked upon its own sort of liberation and and uh, you know nation building is in fact rather different from uh, from uh, india uh, in the sense that uh, you know there has been a, a, a effort to try and uh, have a very major sort of and, and, and very clear break with the past. Uh, while there is a, there are elements of continuity uh, in the Indian system, like for example, I always found in China, uh, our Chinese friends had great difficulty in understanding how it is 
that when British colonial empire in India came to an end, India actually accepted that Mountbatten should continue uh, to be the Governor General of India. You know, I mean, that was something quite, quite uh, alien to the way China, China looked at its own, uh, you know, history. Uh, or that uh, India managed to uh, continue to have uh, very, in fact, very close uh, relations with its uh, former colonial uh, masters. So that, in fact, created the sense that really the independence of India was not really independence. Uh, the liberation of China was true liberation. The Indian, uh, you know, independence was a bit of a fraud, you know. Uh, and even though that might have changed over a period of time, you will see that surfaces very easily uh, whenever there are tensions uh, or strains in the relationship. So what may have been the British before, now it is the Americans. That uh, can re India really be independent? I mean, India is just an uh, arm of the, of the Americans. Uh, so there are ways in which, uh, the way, manner in which we have dealt with, uh, you know, our, our, our uh, uh, emergence from colonialism, uh, and where the China has emerged from a semi-colonial status, uh, those histories are different, and those perceptions uh, have been have been very uh, different. Uh, so there are similarities, yes, between India and China. But uh, at the end of the day, I find that perhaps they are much more different from one another than perhaps we we, we imagine. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Saran. Uh, uh, Professor Gore, uh, would you like to respond to some of the points? Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, people uh, present here, uh, you know China and also know intimately India. Uh, I, uh, I myself, uh, I have to, you know, apologize. I know relatively little about India. I just have um, will have to just speak from impression rather than rigorous uh, analysis. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you talk about the differences, uh, the first thing coming in mind uh, to me is that uh, China has uh, the longest uh, history of bureaucratic, uh, centralized bureaucratic rule um, uh, in the world. You know, uh, so uh, so. Um, uh, it is relatively easy for the CCP to impose uh, uh, on the nation authoritarian, you know, uh, government uh, structure, uh, which you know, Chinese people was under for so many uh, uh, thousand years. So, in a sense, uh, it has an easier time uh, um, compared to you know Indian, you know, as much more diverse. Uh, uh, in various aspects. So it's very difficult uh, to really, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, to really uh, uh, let the CCP come to India probably is a totally failure. It's not going to work at all. Okay. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the issue of democracy, I think, uh, you know, we should uh, talk about, uh, you know, in a more sort of a concrete uh, sense. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, um, um, national objective, if you have uh, a national objective that is uh, accepted uh, by you know, large majority of your po population, that means uh, you are going to have a better time, better time to formulate policy, implement policy, uh, etc. Uh, however, you know, uh, just if you look at the United States today, people just, you know, the, the, the uh, George Packer just published a book about the four Americas. You know, the four Americas, they do not speak the same language. They do not uh, communicate with each other. Therefore, their democratic system is not going to integrate them, you know. So America is going to have a you know, hard time uh, in dealing, you know, uh, with uh, uh, all sorts of problems, including infrastructure building. So in China, you know, uh, most time, uh, most objective is 
diverse, di diverge too much from uh, what the population really need. They need a job, they need uh, food, they need uh, shelter. But Mao is talking about revolution. Therefore, you know, that created a disaster. Uh, comparatively speaking, during the reform period, uh, the, 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 the objective of the, of the regime and the objective of the population is aligned pretty well. Uh, so that's why you see, you know, the, the, the Chinese growth is much faster, much more concentrated. Uh, when you have a five years plan, long-term plan, whatever program, uh, you know, poverty, uh, eradication, etc., cetera, it, it can, 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 you know, implement it relatively easy. So it uh, depends on how much the nation share the view with the regime. Okay, I just stop there. Thank you, Professor Gore. Uh, Dr. Bhim Subha, would you like to come in? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Pallavi, for that too. Uh, you know, uh, I would say very pointed question here. Uh, yeah, with regard to the first query is like, with, do India, China, apart from the so-called the communists, like, are we going to see there are some, uh, you know, divergences or similarities? But uh, yeah, definitely, like, uh, if you really look or restructure or try to see these two things, you know, beyond gradient politics. Uh, definitely, I think, uh, having lived in China and seeing what uh, you, we see as every day as an Indian, and seeing, uh, you know, how politics, uh, you know, delivery of social goods, you know, public goods are being, uh, you know, uh, being uh, structured in China. I think many of the issues, I think we are on the same plane. Only uh, the differences is that, okay, one country is doing pretty better than the other. So yeah, a lot of issues, even from gender issues, even if you look at the representation of women at the, at the party level, they say 10% is the threshold for women. But today, if you see at the county level, at the provincial level, at the, you know, uh, you know at the, no, uh, sorry, city level, you see, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, you see less number of persons. And similarly in India, though, despite we have, uh, you know, constitutional provisions, but that never happens. So, so, you know, some of the nuances are still that we face same kind of issues. With regard to uh, climate change issues today, that has dominated, and sometimes India and China comes, come together uh, to fight this uh, case. I think many of the issues that China faces, we do face, uh, just the communist uh, tries to actually dehyphenate us, actually, most of the issues we face are obviously. And uh, regarding the second, with regard to KM Panikas, actually, uh, you know, write uh, letters to Nehru. Uh, I haven't read that, fully, but however, if I see in hindsight, if I have to see really, if there was such an institution as an ICS, like, so to say, a structure. But in fact, then we could see that in China, then was actually uh, the Indo, uh, sorry, uh, the Chinese-Japanese war. After that war happened, it was actually the CPC fighting with its own brothers, that is the nationalist. So uh, then uh, I think it would be, I think we could have seen in a different sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subha. Um, uh, let me now quickly ask uh, my, my question. I'll reduce from two to one question as the lead questioner, second lead questioner. And I'll follow uh, Pallavi uh, in the sense that uh, ask a question which will further the discussion rather than going back to some of the things which have already been said by the speakers. So my question uh, is uh, that exactly 100 years ago when the Communist Party of China was founded, there was a perception in China at that time that China was facing an existential threat from the foreign imperialist forces, the Western as well as uh, Japan. And today, 100 years later, uh, America, for example, both the American government as well as the President Biden and Pentagon, they've all openly said that today China poses an existential threat to America. 
So uh, uh, since we haven't had much uh, discussion uh, earlier on the geopolitical dimensions, of course, Ambassador Saran mentioned uh, on, the, on those dimensions. So what, what do you think uh, of this change uh, in 100 years that the existence, existential threat uh, being posed uh, on or against how the role reversal has changed? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, U.S.-China relations, I think uh, uh, if you uh, recall, uh, this change, you can say it's long in coming, but actually it happened rather abruptly, you know. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, you can see, you know, Americans, uh, you know, US, China, the flight between US, China packed with business people and the US, uh, uh, you know, uh, high schools, uh, even elementary schools uh, teaching mandarins uh, and uh, there's a tremendous hype on China, you know, uh, seem to be, you know, China is quite, uh, you know, Beijing consensus, that's an American sort of a, a, a book about Americans. So there's a, sudden change of opinion attitude here. Uh, well, regardless of the underlying, you know, causes, I think uh, this uh, just, you know, I would assert that uh, just by this uh, suddenness of change, I think uh, probably this uh, sudden, you know, uh, fatal enemies uh, now perceived uh, probably is not that deep. It's not that, uh, you know, uh, uh, long term. I think uh, if we can suddenly turn worse and uh, it's possible also to suddenly turn warm as well, especially when both countries realize that they really cannot, uh, you know, uh, go without uh, the other's cooperation in today's uh, uh, world. So there's a sort of a, uh, a just, a mutual adjustment, uh, uh, you know, because uh, uh, I think the sudden change comes with the U.S.'s realization that uh, China is going to be ahead of U.S., uh, become number one. And that, uh, you know, psychologically, it cannot uh, accept. Uh, but that's something, you know, real. It uh, doesn't matter you psychologically can, you know, accept or not. That's that's something out there, you know. So U.S., uh, I think the the, the reaction is uh, natural. It want you know uh, want to uh, to stay on top. Uh, this is uh, uh, one. The second one is that the Xi Jinping's policy really caused a lot of concerns. As I said, the Xi Jinping is uh, in a way semi returning to Maoist uh, sort of. Uh, rhetoric, not only rhetoric, but also some policy, some practices. Uh, and he brought back, actually, I think uh, some more, more uh, uh, important that he brought back an uh, old habit, old, you know, way of thinking that uh, China, you know, developed during some small area. Okay, so uh, remind the uh, American of uh, Soviet Union of the red, you know, uh, threat, you know, uh, perils. So, uh, however, if you think, if you think, think carefully, today's China is quite different from the Soviet Union. So, you know, the metaphor is there that, uh, you know, Soviet Union, today's China is uh, Soviet Union uh, resurrected or reincarnated, uh, therefore a new, that called for a new Cold, cold War, uh, a sound that uh, in surface it seemed to make sense, but if you really go down deeper, analyze, things are quite different. I think, uh, you know, gradually the underlying reality is going to emerge on both sides that uh, will, you know, uh, I think uh, moderate uh, things uh, considerable. It's not uh, really, you know, uh, uh, something really uh, existential, sort of uh, uh, put in black 
and white terms, uh, uh, not uh, you know exactly that uh, that uh, in that way. Uh, I think on both sides there's uh, some certain misconceptions uh, and certain emotional loading there. With time, it can be worn down. You know, gradually, you know, they will live, learn to live together. Into this, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gore. Very interesting <laughs> uh, discussion. Ambassador Shamsaran, would you like to uh, uh, comment on that question about the existential well, threat? I, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would uh, say that, uh, you know, we should not forget the uh, domestic dimension in terms of uh, how each uh, country whether it's the US or China, are projecting the other. Uh, so in the in, uh, United States, I think Biden is certainly using the rhetoric of an existential threat from China uh, to try and overcome some of the polarization that has taken hold uh, in the domestic sphere in, in uh, the United States, uh, trying to somehow mobilize a, a kind of a much more, much more... Uh, you know, sort of a united response uh, to uh, China, and thereby trying to overcome some of the some of the polarization. And to some extent, if you see recent uh, initiatives that he has taken, to some extent he has succeeded. Uh, now, uh, the mirror image is, I think, on the Chinese side that uh, if uh, Xi Jinping is really looking for in uh, the year, um, you know, uh, 2022 in the 20th Party Congress, if he's looking at really consolidating his singular sort of uh, position of authority within the party, uh, then, um, you know, also posing, <laughs> posing the United States as a kind of an existential threat uh, also uh, is very helpful in terms of uh, that uh, domestic uh, political compulsion as he uh, sees it. Uh, I do not think that either China is an existential threat to the United States or vice versa. I don't think we have uh, reached that uh, point. And uh, the kind of uh, you know uh, ideological and military confrontation that we had between the uh, uh, between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States during the Cold War, it is simply not possible. Uh, in in in, in uh, today's uh, globalized world, uh, where uh, in fact in, uh, China and US are uh, joined at the hip as far as uh, their economies are concerned, uh, there may be some decoupling taking place at the you know uh, higher levels of uh, of, of uh, technology, but uh, if you look at uh, the rest of the trade and investment between the two countries, they re re remain very very strong, very very extensive. And if you look at the latest surveys, for example, of American companies who are already operating in China, uh, are, they, are they because of the political <laughs> shift, are they planning to move away from China? Are they going to reduce their investment in China despite the incentives that are being given to them? Uh, you find that 95% of them have no plans whatsoever uh, to shift from China. And in fact, many of them are thinking in terms of further expanding their investment in China. By the way, that's the same thing with Japan. If you go to Japan, you will find the same thing. So uh, I think we should also not, uh, not be unaware of what the ground situation is, whatever may be the rhetoric. And by the way, uh, if you see, for example, the response to the opening of the Chinese financial markets, the liberalization that is taking place, you look at the kind of, you know, almost almost a stampede on the part of American finance companies to try and get a share of the of the of the pie. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I would be <laughs> a little careful uh, to take very seriously this uh, this rhetoric about existential challenges. Okay, uh, thank you, Ambassador Saran. We have uh, two questions in the chat box. Let me quickly uh, read out one by one. The first question is from Dr. Ritu Agarwal. How CPC is combining its twin goal of national rejuvenation and social transformation as an important strategy to legitimize its rule over China? Are these still um, uh, big challenges for China? That's question number one. 
And let me also quickly, to save time, move on to the question number two in the chat box. That's from uh, some Ms. Uh, Mr. Nishant Sharma. Uh, question to the panel. Yesterday's People's Daily carried an article on the first page, which ended with a statement that said, and I quote, the various struggles we face are not short term, but long term. These are likely to accompany us through the whole process of achieving our second centenary goal, unquote. So the question is, uh, does this uh, convey that China has accepted the prolonged hostility with the West as a structural feature? What does this say about the Chinese outlook on foreign relations at the present juncture? Um, anyone? Uh, just uh, uh, on the on the issue of legitimacy, of course, China is not a democracy. Therefore, the Communist Party, you know, it's always on its agenda how to gain the support of the people, how to maintain its legitimacy. It's not going to go democratize. Uh, I think, uh, you know, during Deng's time, uh, he adamantly, Chairman Square, you know, incident, uh, he adamantly rejected uh, that option. I think today, the Communist Party even has more reason to reject uh, that option because uh, he pointed to a range of uh, democratically elected uh, government. They say they are not doing that well. And uh, in terms of uh, public opinion polls, uh, China often, Chinese regime support uh, rate uh, often, you know, ranked pretty high. So it's continue, it's going to continue to figure out uh, various ways uh, to show up the, uh, the, the popular support. Uh, you know, whatever it can do, we'll do that. They will continue to do that. So if it is, uh, you know, uh, nationalism, fine, we'll do that. Uh, and also, you know, uh, you know, uh, modernization, uh, yeah, we'll do that. So yeah, uh, that's an ongoing process. Uh, the second question, I think, uh, you know, there is a question, which direction China is going to take? Okay, uh, this question, you know, if you look at the Chinese, read the Chinese, it's very Maoist, it's exactly Mao times, uh, you know, word, uh, you know, uh, language habit, that's exactly from that, that period of time. So I, I just wonder who, whoever wrote this uh, article, how old is him, okay? Uh, and also, um, remember, this uh, sudden turn of uh, uh, deterioration of U.S.-China relations, uh, it, it did not uh, start from China. You know, it started from U.S. Suddenly turned from, you know, turned uh, uh, public opinion turned against China. So, you know, Chinese, uh, if you uh, borrow more, more, more image of uh, U.S. imperialism, of course, that's a long-term struggle, you know, Communism, capitalism, capitalism, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, struggle, uh, life and death struggle. Okay. But how much uh, that is, uh, that kind of a uh, frame, framing, ideological framing is captured in reality, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a big, big question mark there. Whether China is going really, despite the, you know, gener uh, people from uh, Xi's generation, despite their habitual way of thinking, their vocabulary they learned from Mao's time, how that can last, you know, you know, they are not going to live forever. This generation, will, when they passed away, the younger generation, I suspect, their vocabulary and their mindset are going to be different. So when you, whenever you talk about the hundred years, uh, you know you can uh, you can talk about it, uh, but uh, you have no control uh, over that. So I'm not that uh, pessimistic, uh, despite uh, you know current uh, animosities that you see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, a very positive note. Ambassador Saran, do you share the uh, optimism of Professor Lanskor? 
about this, whether this hostility between China and the West is a long-term hostility or structural hostility, etc. <laughs> well, we have seen so many dramatic changes in the geopolitical landscape over the last uh, 50 years that uh, it, I think it would be a very brave person who would make a prediction that this is likely to continue or likely to end. Uh, it will come to an end when it comes to an end. Uh, or it will continue if there are factors which uh, keep pushing it in this direction. But le let me say on balance, as I pointed out, uh, that it's extremely important to keep looking at what the ground situation is, uh, not just look at what the rhetoric may be. Uh, so in that uh, context, I find that uh, whatever may be the uh, nature of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the discourse uh, 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 in, in terms of uh, US-China uh, relations, um, I would go more by what's happening uh, in terms of the actual components of the relationship. So one is uh, politics, yes. Uh, but also we see that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, that I do not see much change except in, the, in, in some of the critical high-tech uh, high sectors. I do not see uh, a conscious effort on the part of China or the United States to really, in a sense, uh, you know, sort of decouple completely on the uh, economic and commercial side. And, you know, this would, it, this would hurt both countries very, very much. Uh, so I think they are pragmatic enough to realize that, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is really not uh, worthwhile. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, there is, unlike the Cold War, there is a certain, shall I say, a, a threshold below which it is difficult to see how further the relationship will go. There are, of course, uh, some vulnerable issues. The greatest vulnerability, as far as I am concerned, is Taiwan. Uh, that, uh, you know, if there is a chance of the relationship really sort of plummeting, and there even being, you know, even the possibility of uh, armed clashes, it is on the issue of Taiwan. And that is because Taiwan is also an emotional issue uh, for China. And therefore, how that is handled uh, is something which may determine whether or not this is structural or this is going to be a long term thing or whether it is something that can be managed. Uh, hostility, there will be competition, there will be, but whether this will be a managed competition, which does not spill over into, into armed conflict, uh, this is something which is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, a matter of leadership, even I would say some uh, element of statementship. But um, I, as I said, I see a certain threshold below which uh, it would be you know, uh, it, it would be, uh, shall I say, uh, somewhat insensible on both sides uh, to allow relationship to fall. Uh, but uh, there are certain issues on which there could be, there could be a much greater worsening of the relationship. And in that, I put Taiwan as number one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Saran. Uh, I think we will need another seminar to discuss whether we are, we have any statesmen left in uh, today's polity <laughs> in, the, in the midst of uh, uh, thugs and killers and wolf warriors. Uh, anyway, that is for another day. And uh, quickly, uh, Dr. Green Suba, if you want to come in just for one minute uh, comment, because we are running really out of time. Uh, yes, I think uh, the question with regard to this, uh, you know, Chinese outlook on foreign relations, the second question I would take. I think it might be, you know, whatever, whoever the author is, having sanctioned by the party, you know, within the structure, it looks like, it looks like a reaction to the recent, uh, you know, uh, UNSC uh, debate on how the West and, and you know, Blinken's visit to Asia, and especially in India, and the politics as Prof, uh, you know, Ambassador Sharan alluded to, is, has become one of the issues for uh, the Chinese uh, reaction on people's daily. I think I would read it that way as of now. And it is for the domestic consumption, definitely, for the domestic population. I, I don't, I don't, uh, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we should not forget that uh, uh, politics uh, is the same e everywhere, and it, people's daily language might also be to, you know, mobilize some kind of a support base for Xi Jinping for next year's party congress. Yeah. So that possibility we can't rule out. Uh, with this, although we have some additional questions in the chat box, but I'm afraid we have completely run out, run out of time. We would have to leave those questions unanswered. And thank you so much uh, for uh, every participant's uh, participation today. My special thanks to our uh, distinguished panel of speakers, uh, Professor Lance Gould from Singapore, Ambassador Sham Saran, Dr. Bhim Subha, and of course, uh, recorded statements from Professor Rana with this, I uh, close today's event. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.